This is a production of Cornell University. Of things administratively, um, there will be very shortly, you should probably download the week four overheads so you have them for notes. We'll be probably getting through most of them today. Um, what's there, if you look at the other, you know, the other weeks in the course documents, there'll be a bunch of just individual files. And then there's also a PowerPoint in there. So I had the TAs put the PowerPoint on there. That PowerPoint is not going to be the final one. So don't like leave class today and go download it. But um, by class on Wednesday, the right one will be down there. But the overheads are definitely the ones that are on there. Uh, keep in mind, homework assignment due on Friday and uh, an exam uh, two weeks from Wednesday, right? Or, yeah, two weeks from Wednesday. All right. I want to start off with something that we did in class on Friday that I got a couple of emails about over the weekend. So kind of had an idea that people weren't quite sure what I was saying. And it had to deal with how we know that the carbon in the atmosphere is basically coming from fossil fuels when we did a bunch of isotopic analyses. So I'm going to do a real simplified example. The numbers I'm going to put up here, the percentages that I'm going to put up on the board are not the right numbers. Okay, So I'm doing this for an illustrative purpose only. All right, so let's assume that in the atmosphere, okay, kind of the background concentration of carbon dioxide is let's say that carbon 13 has 10 molecules and carbon 12, which remember we said is the most abundant carbon, has 100 molecules. So for every 100 carbon 12 molecules, there's 10 carbon-13 molecules. So we can establish a base ratio of 10 over 100 or 10%. So if we look at two other carbon reservoirs, we said the vegetation we're going to be concerned about, and also the fossil fuels. In our example, let's say the vegetation holds 5 carbon-13 molecules. For every 105, I make that 105? Let me make sure I'm doing this the right way. Say it has 5 for every 100 carbon-12 molecules. And we said the fossil fuels, since they're vegetation, they should have pretty much the same ratio. And let's go one step further. We said there's also carbon-14. And let's be concerned mainly with the fossil fuels here. And let's say for the fossil fuels, there are, actually, for the vegetation, let's say there's 1 carbon-14 for every 200 carbon-12 molecules. And in the fossil fuels, remember we said fossil fuels are old. Carbon-14 decays because it's radioactive. Let's say there's 1 carbon-14 for every 1,001 carbon-12. Okay, It's kind of the background. Atmosphere is 10 to 10 is 10%. Vegetation is about 5% for carbon-13 and about 0.5% uh, for carbon-14, one for 200. Fossil fuels, same as vegetation, 5 for 100 for carbon-13, and about 0.1%, one per 1,001 for carbon-12. All right. So let's say we have our atmosphere, again, 10 to 100. And let's say we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So in other words, we, we're going to add more total molecules altogether. We're going to increase both of these. But we preferentially add that carbon from the vegetative reservoir. So the vegetation reservoir has five carbon-13s. For what we say, every 100 carbon-12s. Okay. So let's say I add 100 molecules or 105 molecules. All right. 
what am I going to end up with? Instead of this 10% ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12, if I add 100 molecules or 105 molecules from the vegetative reservoir, solely from the vegetative reservoir, I'm going to end up with here 15 carbon-13 molecules to 200 carbon-12 molecules. So I'm going to see this ratio decrease, and if I do the arithmetic, I'm going to get something like 7.5% for this ratio. And if we take this one step further, let's add even some more carbon, and say we have 20 now for 300. I've added another 105 molecules. I end up with a percentage that looks something like 6.6%. So by looking at this background carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio and seeing it decrease through time gives us some clue as to where the carbon is coming from. It's coming from this source that has a lower carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. If we looked one step further, we could do the same thing for the C14. So in other words, we could say, all right, if I go C14 to C12 in the atmosphere, we said there was one per 100 to start off with. So we have a 1% C14 to C12 ratio. If I add carbon from the vegeta I mean from the fossil fuel reservoir, remember we said the fossil fuels have one per 1,001. So let's say I add 1,001 molecules. I'm going to have two out of 1,100. So my percentage here is not going to be 1%, but it's going to be something like 0.18%. And if I do this again, I'm going to have three out of 2,100 or something like 0.14%. Uh, so again, I'm going to see this ratio decline as I add more carbon to the atmosphere from these specific sources. So we can think of the isotopes as being able to say, okay, this is our key that tags the carbon to say, okay, the carbon from the, from the vegetation is coming from this reservoir because it has a lower C12 to C or C13 to C12 ratio. The carbon from the fossil fuels is coming from this because they have an even lower, say, C14 to C12 ratio. For the, so for the people who were talking about this after class or emailed me about it over the weekend, does that make sense now? Does that make it a little more clear? Don't be bashful. Yes? Okay. I don't see anybody saying otherwise, so we'll go with it. All right. So if you remember class on Friday, we were talking about the faint young sun paradox. And we said long, long ago, billions and billions of years ago, the sun was about 25% less bright than it is today, yet the earth was quite habitable in terms of its temperature. And we left class on Friday saying, well, one of the reasons why this could be the case is that the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere was much higher than it is today. And we said one way that this could happen is if there were a lot of volcanoes early on, or if the existing volcanoes were very active. Okay, so we say, to start off with, we have an Earth with active volcanoes. I underline very active, because to counteract the same faint young sun paradox, we would need to have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's probably somewhere on the order of 500 to 1,000 times the current day levels. Okay? So a lot higher than it is today. And you can say, wow, how can, you know, how can we talk about carbon dioxide concentrations? You know, we're talking here, if we go 1,000 times the present day value, 
you know, we're talking about what? We have 300 today, so we're talking about something like 300,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That seems like a lot of carbon dioxide. Actually, let's make it gigatons. We can work in gigatons a little bit easier. So we could have 3,000, 300,000 parts per million, which would equate to about 700,000 gigatons. Okay. But if we look at this in the big scheme of things, if we take all of the carbon reservoirs, if we add up the rocks and the deep ocean and the surface and the vegetation and all that, and look at this number in perspective to that, we're really talking about only about 1% of the carbon that we have available. So we can take all the available carbon that we have and really just transfer 1% of it out of the other reservoirs and into the atmosphere, we'd be OK. We could counteract the faint young sun. And it could be the volcanoes that do this. We went through the time frame that would be required to do this. And it isn't all that long geologically. All right. So where I left class to say, OK, this could be our, the start of a solution. But it can't be the final solution. Because for this to be the final solution, as the sun got brighter and brighter and brighter, and we know that the sun evolved, okay, something had to happen to all this carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. Or if that wasn't the case, the Earth would continue to have warmed and warmed and warmed, and it would have been a lot warmer than it is today. If we had 1,000 times the CO2 or even 500 times the CO2 we have in the atmosphere today, you know, we wouldn't be talking about global warming, right? We, we would already have had anything bigger than we can even fathom in terms of global warming. So the real answer to the faint young sun paradox is not the mechanism of volcanoes, but actually what we're going to see is it deals with the process of weathering that we talked about. We said to so we'll look at weathering. Okay. So to kind of put a whole bunch of things that we've talked about over the last few lectures into perspective, we talk about weathering. And we're also going to see that weathering has a very important feedback. And this feedback in weathering allows weathering to act like a thermostat. So as the sun gets brighter and delivers more energy to the Earth, the weathering progressively starts removing more and more and more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter, weathering ramps up, and it takes more carbon out of the atmosphere and gradually decreases the carbon dioxide right in step with the sun. We can't make that same argument for volcanoes because it would be a remarkable coincidence that as the sun got brighter and brighter and brighter, the volcanic activity diminished and diminished and diminished. There's no direct tie between the sun and volcanic activity. But weathering provides that tie and it provides that, that feedback. All right, so let's talk about weathering. Basically, two processes going along in weathering. Um, so we're going to do a little chemistry here, not too bad. Both of the weathering processes rely on rain. So basically what we're going to do in weathering to start off with is we need water. And that's going to be in the form of rain. And we need carbon dioxide, which is coming from the atmosphere. And if we add these two together chemically, we get H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. Okay. So this happens all the time. If you were to go out tomorrow when it's snowing and measure the pH of the water that's coming out of the snow, 
or if you go out on a day that it's raining and measure the pH of the rain, you will find that rainwater is acidic. Rainwater is essentially carbonic acid. So even when we talk about acid rain, that's the rain becoming more acidic. Rain water always starts off as being acidic, basically due to the chemical reaction in the atmosphere between the water and the carbon dioxide. So that's the heart of both of the weathering processes. So. Call the, the first process is called hydrolysis. And basically here, in this process, we're going to take calcium silicate and again, don't get bogged down in the chemical symbols and, and all of that, but really get bogged down in what these represent. Rain, atmosphere, carbonic acid. Here, this is basically sand, silicate, quartz. So it's basically rock. Okay. So we take the rock. And we combine it with the rain that is acidic. These two things interact. The acid dissolves, for lack of a better word, the rock that's based in calcium and silicon. And we end up from this having three things. Calcium carbonate, silicate, and water. Okay. So if we follow this whole process from start to finish, we have to go over here. So we're basically taking CO2 that's in the atmosphere, it's getting locked up in the rainwater, it's reacting with these rocks and giving us three byproducts of which carbon dioxide isn't one of them. So the carbon from the atmosphere is getting caught up in those two molecules, that water eventually runs off and eventually makes its way to the ocean. And if you're good, you'll see that these things eventually become shells. So these are the building blocks for the shells of the marine organisms. So the biology, the, biolog the biosphere is getting involved here. And then the other, the other byproduct is just plain old water. So we've locked up the carbon through this process. Okay, the other process is desolution. And it's similar. We're going to work with a different kind of rock to start off with. So our starting point here is not silicate based, but it's calcium carbonate. And this is basically limestone. So again, it's still, the key here is it's rock. And that interacts with the rain. gives us more or less the same thing, water and CO2. This again becomes shells. All right, so question, which of these processes do you think is the most important for removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Hydrolysis, why? 
it just released, this just releases CO2 back right back to the atmosphere. So this is nothing more than recycling. It's taking it out of commission for a while, perhaps, as it gets locked up in the shells or whatever. But it really doesn't lead to much of a net reduction in CO2. I don't have my numbers and stuff up there. But we really don't. We still have CO2 as a byproduct. So this is not as effective. Okay. So really we're going to look at hydrolysis as the mechanism to provide the thermostat for the faint young sun paradox. And for this to happen, as the sun gets brighter, what has to happen to this chemical reaction? in order for it to provide a thermostat for the faint young sun? It's got to what? It's got to speed up. It's got to work harder. Right. It's got to go faster. More of this has to occur. All right. So Okay, so why do you think, why do you think hydrolysis will go faster or be more effective when the sun is brighter? What might cause that to happen? All right, more rain. So clearly hyd We have more rain. Anybody else? No chemists in the room? Is it endothermic? It's, uh, help me out here. I'm not a chemist. <laughs> um, it's going to? More, more heat speeds up the reaction. More speed heats up the reaction, right. So we get a faster reaction. When it's hotter. So two things going for it, right? Sun gets brighter. We all know the air should get hotter. That's speeding up this process. Okay. We can make the next jump to say, okay, the Earth gets hotter, more water evaporates, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, it rains more. So we have more rain. The third piece of this puzzle. is there's more vegetation in the world. So as the sun gets brighter, we get more vegetation. We get more vegetation because it's warmer. We get more vegetation because there's more rain. And then you might look at the equation and say, where does vegetation come into play in that equation? So that's probably, you know, we can all see that if we have more rain, we have more of this to work with. If it's warmer, the whole reaction speeds up. Where the vegetation comes into play, if you remember the, the picture, the overhead we had of the carbon cycle, there's, also, there's weathering from the surface, but there's also weathering from more of the deeper rock reservoir. And what happens here is that the vegetation basically is an effective mechanism for taking carbon from the vegetation and introducing carbon to the soil, right? Via the incorporation of organic matter. And this carbon that's locked in the soil is then available to acidify the groundwater. So the water that might be locked up in the geological, the rock reservoir, also has an opportunity to get acidified due to the organic matter that the vegetation might be incorporating into the soil. And therefore, that is available to interact 
with the silicate rock. So three things going on there. Okay, so to put some numbers on these, for the temperature, basically we double the, double the reaction rate for about a 10 degree C increase in temperature. Okay. So t temperature is clearly the direct effect. If we look at more rain, again, we said generally we add, we make the air warmer, it holds more water. That water eventually falls out as precipitation, so we're increasing um, the amount of rain that's available, and that's really the thing that's driving this whole weathering process. You know, we're just adding more of the raw material, and it's this that's really driving things. We always have enough rocks. It's going to be the water that's limiting, and here we're increasing the water more. Um, and if we look at the vegetation, if basically we just put some numbers on this, we can measure this. Now, if we measure the weathering effect on current day land surfaces, what we see is that vegetative land surfaces have two to ten times more weathering than non-vegetative surfaces. Okay? So the vegetation does play a big role. It's almost an analogous role to the temperature. Adding 10 degrees C is doubling it. Here we're doubling it or even more by just adding vegetation. So if we put this all together, we really have a very nifty feedback loop. Okay, to kind of use our terms, we're going to start off with an initial forcing. And here it's the sun getting brighter. So that's our forcing. And we see a warmer climate, of course. And we see an increase in temperature, an increase in precip, and an increase in vegetation. All of that gives us increased weathering. We see CO2 be removed, since that's what the weathering process does. And we end up with a chilly. cooler climate. So we get brighter sun, warms the climate, these things go up, weathering goes up, CO2 is removed, the climate becomes cooler. To say positive or a negative feedback, it's a negative, right? It's counteracting what's going on. So precisely what we need to counteract the faint young sun. Okay? We could do this the other way in this, let's say the climate gets, let's say the sun gets Weaker, it's not as bright. So if our initial forcing is the sun getting dimmer, our climate's going to cool, all of these things are going to go down, weathering is going to go down, less CO2 is removed, the climate stays warmer than it would have been for the current forcing. Again, a negative feedback. It's counteracting that initial forcing. So this works very, very nicely in our mechanism here to bring down the CO2 as the sun gets brighter. Okay. All right. So to kind of finish up this long, long, long time ago climate change, we also mentioned a while back that if we didn't have this paradox, this mechanism, and the sun was so weak, 
that the Earth would be pretty much a snowball. We said the average temperature of the Earth would be minus 38 degrees C. All the oceans would be frozen over. And it wouldn't be a nice picture, okay, especially for us. However, we said, okay, very, very early on, this probably wasn't the case because the, because the Earth was so volcanically active and the greenhouse gases were there. But if we look actually a little bit closer to the present and maybe go back seven, about 700 million years ago, we can find some cases, again, we're billions of years here, so we're taking a couple of big steps forward. We can find some geological evidence that suggests, yes, maybe the Earth was indeed totally frozen over at some point in its history. All the oceans were frozen. So let's just keep that in mind and let's say, okay, let's say the Earth did freeze over, okay? The sun was weak or whatever, ice albedo <laughs> feedback mechanism went wild, and the whole Earth is frozen. How does the Earth get out of that? Let's say, let's take it for fact that it did happen, and yet here we are today, okay? So how did the Earth come out of that seemingly, you know, really, really bad fate that it was nothing but a big snowball in outer space? What could have done that? You know, think about it. Look at the reservoirs. If the Earth is totally frozen over, you know, what happens to all these exchanges of carbon? Well, there ain't no plants, no vegetation, so we don't have that. The oceans are, you know, all those exchanges with the ocean are basically capped because the ocean is frozen over, so we don't have any exchange of carbon between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, clearly, weathering is out of the picture, right? Because it's not raining, it's snowing, and we're accumulating ice in that situation. What saves the Earth in that case? Volcanoes. So volcanoes there, even if the Earth, even if it does get that bad, even if, again, think of Daisy World, okay? So this is Daisy World almost to that point where we've reached that second equilibrium point. But the thing that saves us there is that even though the Earth is frozen over, it's still warm in its center. There's still volcanic activity. There's still lots and lots of rocks that are available to be melted in the center of the Earth and release CO2 through the atmosphere. And the volcanoes don't care if the Earth is frozen over. They still provide a mechanism for getting that carbon out. And with the greenhouse gases, the Earth can warm and warm and warm, melt the ice, and we can start things going again. Okay, so a slow process, but it is possible to get out of that. All right, so that's Snowball Earth. Um, all right, before we move on, um, there is another hypothesis or theory for kind of counteracting the faint young sun paradox. Here, we're implicating weathering as the solution. But in an alternative hypothesis that's called the Gaia hypothesis, okay. And again, this is not a mainstream hypothesis. I bring it up just to kind of make you think, and it has some implications. But really, the Gaia hypothesis gained popularity in the 80s. And really, it says that life regulates the Earth's climate for its own good. OK, so basically, in its more extreme case, it says that evolution has occurred for the good of the planet, for the climatic good of the planet. So we really don't see it in this picture, but actually weathering also relies on micro, microorganisms and things like that that are going on that are helping the weathering process where we talk about the vegetation. Okay? So we could say, OK, as time goes on and life evolves, it changes weathering. There's not a lot of life early on when the sun is very weak, so there's not a lot of weathering. As it gets warmer, things start to evolve and, and, and implicate in the, in, the, in the weathering picture, and, and we get more weathering. So that's all I'm going to say about that, really. Um, just kind of to maybe put the thought in your mind to say, OK, if this, is, if this hypothesis is indeed true, um, it has some very... Um, it has some implications, perhaps, for what we're doing today. It makes you kind of think, are we doing this 
for some other reason. And I'll leave it at that and won't say much about that. Anyway, we're going to move on now. Um, and look back a mere almost 500 million years. And look at how the Earth's climate has evolved over those time frames. And really what we're going to be concerned about is at in given points in time in this long time frame, does the Earth have ice sheets or not? So we can look at basically make a little table here. Say ice sheets. And the thing we're going to go with is are there continents in polar regions of the Earth? So here, really, we're talking about the continents moving around the Earth. We're talking about plate tectonics and, their, and that effect on the Earth's climate. So for about, and these are going to be millions of years ago. So for at 430 million years ago, Yes, there's ice sheets. Yes, there's polar continents. For some place between 425 and 325, there are no ice sheets, but there are polar continents. We go 3520 to 240. Yes, there are. 240 to 125. No, there aren't. And no, there aren't. One twenty five to thirty five million years ago. No ice sheets. Yes, there are polar continents. And basically up to the present. Yes, there are, and yes, there are. Okay, So basically, we look at this, and we don't have a perfect match. But we can say at least one thing is, when there are ice sheets on the Earth, one of the requirements is for there to be continents in polar regions. So really, when we talk about ice sheets, we're not talking about ice in the ocean. Okay. We'll see throughout the semester. That is going to be called sea ice, and that's very different. Okay? But literally, is there ice on land, on the Earth's land masses? And the answer here is yes, there is, if those land masses happen to be in polar regions. It works here, it works here, it works here, it works today. It basically falls apart in two periods of time. Here and here. Okay. So all right. So again, during these periods of time, particularly well actually in both of these, there are no ice sheets, yet there are polar continents. So to kind of follow up our discussion, what do you think is happening? Even though we have land masses at high latitudes, what could be preventing them from having ice sheets? Think about contemporary climate change. Too much CO2 in the atmosphere, right? We say, OK, if we keep adding CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, eventually Greenland's going to melt and Antarctica is going to melt. So here's a way where we can say, OK, we can use this these real, real long time frames ago, to kind of get a clue on what might happen if CO2 in the atmosphere um, gets a, as high or higher, actually, than is predicted to occur over the next 100 or so years. So really, why these might not have ice sheets is due to increases in CO2 in the atmosphere. Yeah. 
And really what we see is when there's no ice, even though there is polar, or even though there are polar continents, what we tend to see is that the spreading rate of the continents is relatively fast. Okay? So plate tectonics is going full bore as an analogy here, during these times when there are polar continents, but there, but there isn't any ice. And really what this says is that when the spreading rate is fast, the Earth tends to be more volcanically active. So kind of just to do geology 101 in about two minutes, basically we have two things that are going on when these continents are spreading. Okay? The first thing that could be going on is that we have convergent plates. Okay, so basically we have one plate sinking under another plate. Okay. So in other words, we have rock that's getting pushed deeper into the Earth's surface. Okay. So this is called, this sinking is called subduction. Okay. And what's happening is this rock sinks and it gets closer to the center of the Earth, it melts and it produces lava. And the carbon that's locked in that rock is being released as carbon dioxide, okay, or at least being stored as carbon dioxide. So we're kind of thinking this is a way, this is a mechanism to release the CO2 from the rocks. So not only can the plates be convergent, but they can be also divergent. So here we might have two plates, and they're spreading away from each other. And what does that do? That allows this CO2 and lava and rock to come out. So this is basically areas of active volcanoes. So basically, if we put this together and look at this spreading theory, what do, what do we have? We have fast spreading of the continents. That gives us rapid CO2 release, okay? So fast spreading. Leads to rapid CO2. We warm the climate. We increase weathering. And we actually remove this CO2. And hence reduce the warming. So even here, even when we talk about this spreading, weathering is involved. 
And weathering is, again, mod moderating whatever changes we might see in the spreading rates. Okay, one last thing in the, in the little bit of time that I have. If we look at how these plates work, we can have one other thing that's going on. Instead of the plates when they we had subduction here, when the plates come together, when they converge, they can also lead to uplift. So here we have two plates that are moving together. And instead of subducting going down, when they collide, they actually end up like a car accident, a collision. They upheave. Okay. So basically here we have mountain building. We look at the Himalayas today. The Himalayas are there because of this. India smacking into the rest of Asia, and we're getting the Himalayas. Okay. What do you think this process, if anything, this process of mountain building or uplift might have to do with weathering? What might, have, might, what might it have to do with weathering? Go ahead. Exactly. It exposes more rock to be weathered. Okay. So this idea of plates colliding and uplifting provides fresh rock. If you think about it, if the Earth didn't have this going on and we just had kind of a crust of rock, you know, eventually all the rocks would be weathered. And the weathering rate would actually go down through time. But what the fact that plates can collide and kind of bring rocks up to the surface is a way to increase weathering. Not only does it provide fresh rocks, but if I was good and it wasn't Monday morning, what I was planning on doing was bringing two beakers of water and sticking a sugar cube in one and a bunch of chopped up sugar into the other one. Which, which would melt first? The chopped up sugar, okay? So what it's also doing when we're looking at mountain building is it's providing more surface area to be weathered in the rock. So again, the weathering is occurring at the surface. So the more surface area we have, just like the grains of sugar have more surface area than one big block of sugar, okay, the weathering process can occur quicker. So I'm definitely out of time. Um, see you guys all on Wednesday. <laughs>